Okay, so it's 15 past, so let, let's start. So welcome everyone to this machine learning coffee seminar. This is the first session of the year. So it, it's, it's a very special one and we have a we have really cool, cool guest today. Uh, but before that, I might give a few words about this machine learning seminar itself. So this is organized by the Finnish Center of AI and University of Helsinki and Aalto University. And, and this seminar has been going already for, for a while, so a few years. And the idea is to really have a weekly seminar where we give spotlight for sort of high quality scientific talks by, by Finnish, Finnish researchers or, or researchers associated with Finland in some sense. And we are organizing this with uh, the associate professor Laura Ruotsalainen from University of Helsinki. And I am an academic research fellow from Aalto University. Uh, and uh, the, we have the FKI has a website for, for this seminar series where we have all the most current information about this. Okay, but, but welcome everyone. So today we have a really cool talk by, by Tero Carras from NVIDIA. So he's going to give a sort of paper presentation about training genetic artificial networks with limited data. And I would also want to mention that this paper was, was sort of rewarded with the oral presentation in, in last NIPS. So this is, this is really hot stuff. Okay, Tero, please go ahead. And, and okay, sorry, I forgot to mention that if you have any questions, uh, can you please uh, write them in the chat and then I will then uh, uh, forward them to the speaker. Okay, thanks. Tero, please. Thanks, Markus. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Tero Karas from NVIDIA. Um, let's see. There's been explosive growth in the quality of computer synthesized content. One of, one of the recent techniques is StyleGAN2 from our group, uh, presented at last year's CVPR. The person you see here is not real. The image was generated from scratch by StyleGAN2 based on just a bunch of random numbers. The mapping from those random numbers to images is smooth so we can get seamless interpolation between different people by just modifying the inputs to the model. The behavior is also disentangled in the sense that different directions in the input space correspond to different visual attributes of the image. And there has actually been uh, a lot of follow-up work to find meaningful directions that enable us to do modifications to the image, like changing the viewing angle, the facial expression, age, gender, and so on. The technique works equally well on any kinds of images, but I think human faces are an interesting test case because they are so unforgiving. Um, if there's anything wrong with the face, we'll be sure to spot it. Of course, by training uh, with different kind of data, we can also do fun things like explore different artistic painting styles and many, many other things. There's somewhat of a problem though. Training these models tends to require quite a lot of training data. So in order to get the results that I just showed, we had to use 70,000 high quality photographs of real people to serve as reference. This is kind of problematic because um, collecting sufficient data can be extremely tedious and in some applications it may not even be possible. So as Mark Marcus mentioned, um, I will tackle the problem head on in this talk by presenting our latest paper, Training Generative Adversarial Networks with Limited Data, which was presented as an oral at last year's NeurIPS. This is a collaboration with Mika Aittala, Jan Helsten, Samuli Laine, Jaakko Lehtinen and Timo Aila. But before I dive into the details, I'll briefly review the basics. StyleGAN2 is an example of a data-driven generative model. The basic premise is that we have some distribution, say the distribution of cat images, and we wish to model that distribution uh, statistically. So we train a generator based on a number of examples. If we're successful, that basically gives us a recipe for generating new images. So after training, when we run the, 
the generator by providing a random latent code, we get a novel image that is different from any of those in the training data, but ideally still indistinguishable. And we can repeat this any number of times to get infinite number of new images. Generative models have been studied for decades, but the recent success is largely a result of a breakthrough that came in 2014 with the introduction of generative adversarial networks. It's generally quite hard to formulate the right kind of objective for this kind of a generator. So the trick here is that we actually don't. We learn the objective itself from the data. We essentially have a collaboration between two neural networks. Generator is the one producing the images and discriminator is tasked with comparing those to the training examples and then providing the generator with feedback on how to improve. Both networks are <coughs> initialized randomly, so at the beginning they don't really know what they should be doing, but then as the training goes by, they will help each other improve. So we essentially have a two-player game. Player one is the generator, G, and player two is the discriminator, D. Um, we train these in an alternating fashion. So to train the discriminator, we start by running the generator a couple of times to produce some images, which we then feed to the discriminator. And now we want the discriminator to correctly classify these as being generated. So we update its weights. It will do a slightly better job in the next rounds. Similarly, we also show it a bunch of real images and train it to correctly classify them as being real. Then to train the generator, we start the same way. Generate a bunch of images, see what the discriminator thinks. But the twist now is that we actually flip the training objective and we want uh, the discriminator to misclassify these images as actually being real. So if we do that and back propagate through the D, uh, we'll essentially get feedback on what's wrong with the images. And then when we proceed to back prop to the generator, we'll uh, find a way to help the generator fix its mistakes. So this way, when we keep repeating these steps, the images will gradually get better and better until hopefully at the end, they're indistinguishable from the training data. So why does this process require so much data then? Here's a typical convergence curve of StyleGAN2. X-axis is the training progress. Y-axis is fresh A inception distance, lower is better. We can see that if we have enough data, the convergence is steady and the results keep improving the longer we train. But if we have too little data, uh, the training diverges and the results actually start to get worse and worse. At the end, the images are completely broken. At some point they were better, but still quite far from what we'd like to see. If we add more data, we'll get better results, but we're not quite there until we have in the ballpark of 100,000 images. Let's take a closer look at one of these cases. The bottom plot here shows uh, how the outputs of the discriminator behave over the course of training. Each vertical slice corresponds to a histogram where positive values indicate that the discriminator thinks a given image to be real and negative indicates that it thinks it's generated. We can see that as time goes by, the two distributions are slowly drifting apart, meaning that the discriminator is seemingly getting better and more confident in its predictions. If we look at the case with less training data, we can see that um, this drift starts earlier and happens faster. Interestingly, the point of divergence seems to correlate with the overlap between these two distributions. At the beginning, they do overlap and we are making steady progress. 
but as soon as the overlap is lost, things start going downhill. Here's a similar plot for a separate validation set. These are Im uh, images that are actually real, but they were never shown during training. And we can see that toward the end, the discriminator is actually convinced that these are not real images. It has es essentially learned, um, memorized the entire training set and learned to output positive values only for those particular images, negative for everything else. So it can no longer provide meaningful feedback. This is a clear sign of overfitting, which is of course a well-known problem in deep learning. There's many existing solutions, but unfortunately none of them is really that helpful with GANs. There's for example augmentation, which means artificially amplifying the training set with uh, random image transformations. But there's a problem. If we train a GAN with such an uh, augmented training set, we'll also see those same augmentations in the generated images, which is undesirable. Augmentations effectively leak to the output. Then there's, for example, regularization, which has been tried a couple of times uh, with GANs. In this paper, for example, the idea is to improve the generalization of the discriminator by making it blind to certain image transformations. But if the discriminator is indeed blind to something like rotation, then there's nothing really preventing the generator from accidentally producing rotated images. And we have actually confirmed that this indeed happens in practice. Then there's things like decreasing network capacity, employing dropout or a bunch of other techniques. We have tried many of those and concluded that they don't really help all that much with GANs. So what to do? Of course, uh, in practice, we know that augmentations have been hugely successful in other areas of deep learning. So ideally, we'd like to somehow be able to get the full benefits of those, but still make sure that we're not introducing leaks. Our idea is very simple. In addition to augmenting the real images uh, from the training data, we'll also be augmenting the generated ones. So basically everything that the discriminator sees is gonna be augmented, both when training D itself and also when training G. So while the idea is pretty simple, it's not immediately obvious why it would even work. Because if we want the generator to produce something like this, um, it, it, it's not clear how the discriminator could provide meaningful feedback if it only sees something like this. To understand what's going on, let's take a look at things from the theoretical side. Suppose we have an original distribution X where every point corresponds to some clean, clean image. We can model the augmentations by defini defining operator T that is stochastic in the sense that every time we augment a given image, we'll get a different random realization out. This in turn form some distribution. And if we repeat the process over the entire X, we'll arrive at an augmented distribution TX that is basically a mishmash of all the possible images and all the possible ways we could augment them. During training, we are concerned with two distributions, generated images X and real images Y. And what's happening is that the discriminator is essentially comparing these two distributions and penalizing any discrepancies, which will gradually drive X to be more and more like Y. With augmentation, we are not only concerned with the original distributions, but also their augmented versions. And these are now the ones that the discriminator is looking at. It's driving TX to match TY. And of course, as a side effect, we want X to also be driven toward Y. But will it? 
If we have arrived at the situation where Tx indeed equals Ty, we will know for sure that x must also equal y if the augmentation operator is invertible, meaning that there is only one such x that maps to this particular Tx. If it's not invertible, then there could be multiple uh, alternative x's that all maps to, map to the same Tx. So even if Tx is correct, x could be any of those incorrect solutions. I'll give a concrete example. Suppose our generator is otherwise perfect, but for whatever reason, it's producing upside down images. If we augment these images with random 90 degree rotations, we'll get an even distribution over all the possible orientations. And now when the discriminator is looking at these distributions, uh, it doesn't see that there's anything wrong. They look identical. This is an example of a non-invertible uh, transformation. It has destroyed vital information about the original distribution. Luckily enough, we can actually rectify this problem by simply doing the augmentation with slightly uneven probability. So here we are slightly more likely to retain the original orientation of the image. Now the distributions no longer look the same and the discriminator can cor correctly spot that there's something wrong. It will drive the augmented distributions to match and the only way the generator can accomplish that in this case is to actually learn to flip the images and produce uh, them upright. This is an example of an invertible transformation. So at least in theory, things will be fine as long as the operator is invertible. Note that it's enough if it's invertible for the distribution as a whole. It doesn't need to be invertible for any individual image. In the paper, we analyze many augmentations commonly used in deep learning. And uh, we conclude that they are not invertible on their own, but it also turns out that they can all be made invertible with the same trick that I just, just showed. So we select some probability P less than one, and then we'll simply toss a coin, sometimes skip the uh, augmentation with probability one minus P or apply it with probability P. Furthermore, we are free to chain multiple augmentations together. If all the individual ones are invertible, then their composition is also guaranteed to be invertible. So in theory, it's enough if uh, P is less than one. In practice, though, we have found that leaks can still occur if it's too close to one due to nasty little de details like finite sampling, finite capacity, and so on. Here's an experiment. X-axis is the augmentation probability and the dots represent individual training runs. We highlight the trend as a mixture of cautions and we can see three different regions here. If P is low enough, then things are fine and the images look correct. If it's slightly too high, then the generator is kind of confused and it's producing images in multiple orientations. And if the probability is way too high, then the images are consistently oriented the wrong way. We've repeated this experiment for several different augmentations and concluded that things seem to be fine as long as P is less than 0 0.8, which is good enough in practice. Based on these findings, we develop a custom augmentation pipeline consisting of 18 non-leaking augmentations. These include things like flips, rotation, scaling, uh, color, color transformations, sharpening, blurring, and so on. We simply stack all of those <clears throat> together and use a single shared value of P for all of them. It's worth pointing out that the entire augmentation pipeline has to be differentiable because we need to be able to backprop through it to get gradients for the generator. 
It also needs to run on the GPU efficiently in order to not slow down the training. We tested uh, different combinations of these augmentation categories and concluded that some of them are not really helpful. So I'll be using the first three categories in all subsequent results. There's one question remaining. Which value of P should we actually choose to use then? Here's another experiment. Again, the dots represent individual training runs and the x-axis is our augmentation probability. We, uh, zero means no augmentation. 0 0.4 is already pretty heavy augmentation. And at 0 0.8, we run at the danger of introducing leaks. We can see that uh, with a small training set, um, the augmentations are hugely successful. We get up to 4x improvement in FID. But if we look at larger training sets, we can also see that the optimal choice for P tends to vary quite a lot. So it's essentially yet another hyperparameter that we need to tune on a case-by-case -case basis using a costly grid search. In the case uh, where we have a lot of training data, uh, there's no overfitting, no problem to be fixed, so the augmentations are purely harmful. Of course, we'd like to avoid this kind of hyperparameter tuning. So recall my previous example uh, with the discriminator outputs. It was all about overlap, and overlap is actually easy to measure. So what we'll do is we'll monitor the average sign of the discriminator output for the training images shown during training and then uh, um, select a target value for that average and tune the value of p uh, accordingly. So if the average is too high, it means the distributions have drift drifted apart and uh, will compensate by augmenting more. If the, uh, if the average is too low, then we're free to uh, reduce the amount of augmentation. We call the resulting technique Adaptive Discriminator Augmentation, or ADA for short. And here's what happens when we turn it on. The distributions keep overlapping all the way throughout training, and the FID just keeps decreasing. Which target value should we choose then? Here's again a plot where x-axis is the target value. And we can already see uh, that ADA is actually giving us better results than the best uh, fixed P, which is promising. And when we look at uh, different training set sizes, we can see that the behavior is very consistent. The same target value works equally well for all training set sizes. So we'll just use this value and keep the hyperparameters fixed. Here's an example of how the probability evolves over the course of training. We can see that smaller data sets naturally lead to higher amounts of augmentation. And the value uh, also tends to increase over time to compensate for the drift that would happen otherwise. So now that we have a complete working technique, let's see how well it does. Here's baseline results for FFHQ, high quality human faces uh, using Stylegan 2. X-axis corresponds to random subsets of the training data and we repeat each experiment three times, reporting the median, min and max. We can see that the results of Stalkan 2 are actually quite uh, consistent, so there's not that much variation. Here's another uh, data set, Els and Cat, which is much more difficult. It's uh, more varied and more chaotic in nature, but overall the curve looks pretty similar. So now when we throw in ADA, we can see that the results get drastically better, especially at the smaller training set sizes. And in the best case, we can get comparable results with up to 10x less training data. 
For a real trial by fire, we collected a new data set by scraping the Metropolitan Museum of Art for high quality portrait paintings. And um, our thing is that there aren't that many of those. We only got a bit over 1K images. But we, with ADA, we were able to train with that data. Uh, the images on the left are actually generated ones. We also tested a bunch of other small data sets and here's some example interpolations. Besides looking nice, the uh, important thing about the interpolations is that we are not overfitting. You, you could think that if we have um, like a thousand training images, then the generator would just learn to produce carbon copies of those images, but it's not. Since we're able to interpolate, it, it means that we are still able to produce infinite variations. Here's AFHQ, Animal Faces dataset from the Stargan V2 paper. There's three categories, um, cats, dogs and wild animals, uh, which we train separately. So there's about 5k images per category. Overall, the images look very sharp, which is uncommon for these tiny data sets. Here we have some tissue samples, a very different case from those human and animal faces, but we can see that it still works. Here's the FID for each of these data sets uh, for baseline Stylegan 2 and with our technique. We can see dramatic improvements all across the board. But uh, looking at the results, we have actually observed that FID itself is not that good of a metric for these tiny data sets because of its inherent bias. And we found another metric, kernel inception distance, to give um, more consistent results, better at highlighting the differences. We also tested with transfer learning, which improves the baseline considerably, but still ADA remains much better in all cases. Transfer learning basically means that we start from pre-trained models with some other data set, FHQ in this case, and then simply resume the training with a new data. <clears throat> Interestingly, we happened to also try the uh, popular CIFAR-10 benchmark. This is a 50K dataset consisting of these tiny 32 by 32 images. And it's important because it's the most widely used dataset in GAN papers. There's been fierce competition to drive the FID numbers down. But it turns out that CIFAR-10 also suffers from the same kind of overfitting so just by enabling ADA, we get dramatic improvements, much better than um, ever been reported in any other paper, which is kind of interesting. We have made our implementation publicly available, so you can uh, Google for these keywords to find it on GitHub. Besides adding ADA, we have also made other improvements to Stylegan 2, like um, introducing NVIDIA Tensor Core acceleration and many other things. So if you're interested, just pick it up and start playing with the models. It, it's pretty easy. I should also mention that there have been similar ideas popping up in a parallel work. So if you're interested in the topic, I recommend checking out these three papers at least. With that, I'd like to thank my co-authors and other people who have helped with the project as well as the audience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tara, for, for a really cool talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So any questions, please raise your hand or write in the chat. So this is, this is Jakob. Um, Thanks, Terot, uh, for the talk. I, uh, like I wrote in the chat, I think it's worth mentioning that even though the current released code is, uh, is, is based on TensorFlow 1.x, 1. 1. 
there is a PyTorch code release that will be, uh, be, be made publicly available in, uh, in a short, short amount of time. Very, very good point. Thanks, Jaakko. So we are planning to release the new um, cleaned up, easier to use PyTorch version by the end of January. Okay, so, so Jörg Tiedemann has, has a question in, in, in chat. So he asks, did you try something different than image data as well? Good question. We did not simply to keep the scope of the paper manageable. It, it's been difficult to squeeze all this amount of experiments and results and data in eight pages. But you can definitely apply the same technique to other modalities as well. There's been many papers about that. So for, well, even with images, it doesn't need to be, you know, photographs and paintings. It could be X-ray images or LiDAR data or depth maps or whatever. And then of course, other kinds of dense data like audio, uh, 3D volumes is also, you know, doable. Maybe adding, adding to this, um, my understanding is that, um, that autoregressive models, uh, sequence models like, like for text, GANs have not really um, gotten that much, much success in, uh, in that kind of regime. And as I, as I recall, there's, um, there's, uh, there, there are some fundamental reasons to that. I recall chatting with, uh, with Dikas Garg about this uh, some some months back, and this is a, this is a discussion that would be very uh, very good to have uh, have with him. Good point, and yes, it's worth mentioning that GANs are not the only uh, type of models that are able to give such impressive generation results. It's one of the most popular techniques, but there are others, especially autoregressive models like transformers. Okay, thanks. And, and then Rui Sampaio then has a sort of like a follow-up question of, is there a way to apply this methodology time series data? I guess this now connects with the autoregressive discussion. Yeah, so yes, definitely you can apply it, but um, as Jaakko mentioned, it kind of remains somewhat an open question like which, um, which technique is the best for that case. Like uh, why has autoregressive been more successful in time series or sequential data? And why has GAN been more successful in image data? I don't think we have seen uh, the full story yet. Well, I mean, you could write an autoregressive GAN, and people have, uh, but but my understanding is that they just don't work all that uh, all that well in in lots of lots of cases. Exactly. Yeah, I guess in autoregressive models, any kind of errors will accumulate because you are re repeatedly applying the same model, and then it, it's just like the demands for accuracy are just so much higher. But I guess then it becomes a control problem. How do you control your system as it goes? And I guess then your sort of your adaptive tuning could be a possible solution there, maybe in one form or other. other, other. Yeah, especially with uh, GPT, you often see these examples where, you know, randomly the model ends up repeating the same phrase or same words over and over. So that, that's definitely one problem. Okay, and then we also have in chat, we have from Harry Pölönen, uh, do you have a 3D implementation of this? So he has a need to generate 3D medical data from 400 training cases. We don't. Um, in principle, 3D is not much different from 2D. Like it's a convolutional architecture. You can replace 2D convolutions with 3D convolutions. But of course, in practice, uh, the big difficulty is memory consumption and uh, performance. So 3D data is usually much bigger than 2D data. And um, 
It's a good question. Uh, like, what is needed to properly scale up these models for, you know, bigger 3D volumes? I don't have a ready-made answer for that, but my hunch is that it's um, mainly about tuning the implementation, tuning the parameters. If I, if can I can I... add something to that, uh, is um, so it is like amount or number of training amount of training data is an issue. Three uh, D data sets tend to be, um, you know, it's 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 going to be hard to find a hundred thousand high resolution three D scan volumes of anything, um, and then there's the memory consumption issues. Uh, but we have been thinking about. So what would it require for us to scale, say, StyleGAN 2 above the 1K resolution, like megapixel resolution, uh, for even for 2D images? And there's a data availability issue. There's, there's lots of images available for, for megapixel uh, resolutions. For, for 2 megapixels, there's you know, a significant drop. And then for 4K resolution, uh, the, 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 the amount of data that you can find online is just really, really a lot smaller. And uh, we, we have been sort of throwing around ideas on, on employing sort of this, this multi-resolution uh, multi nature of the StyleGAN model in conjunction with some training procedure augmentations that would, uh, that would make use of, of, res of data that come in multiple different resolutions, only train some of the finer levels with, with you know, crops of, of, of those high-resolution images and... Uh, probably similar things could be applied to making 3D training more tractable as well. Sorry, can I comment also with audio? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, the 3D medical case may not be as difficult as you think, because with phases, 2D phases, you have lots of variation in the data, or lots of variation in the phases, but with many cases with medical data, you don't actually you don't actually have that much of a variation. For example, if you have a brain data, then all human brains are actually pretty similar. So the actual variation that you need to catch with the model is is small. And I have already used this progressive gun to to this data set with less than 400 data training cases. And the results are actually pretty good. So the data may not be the problem here, but the problem is that I just need a 3D implementation. And also the image size is about 2 million voxels because the, it's around 128 voxels in each dimension. So that, that becomes about 2 million voxels. And to get the real MRI image resolution, for example, we are planning to use super resolution methods. So we are not trying to create the realistic resolution in the first place. So this is the problem. That actually does sound... Very promising, yeah. So two uh, megavoxels is, isn't all, all that bad. It's just twice the amount we had in those 1K by 1K images. And um, in the StyleGAN2 ADA code base, there's, for example, the FP16, the tensor core uh, acceleration. And the side effect of that is that it halves the memory consumption so I think, uh, you know, we would have no trouble uh, training to megapixels as far as the memory consumption is concerned. Yeah, that's, that's true what Jaco comments on chat, that the data is color, it's not, not RGB3 channel data, at least that, in the first phase. Right. Doesn't really matter uh, regarding the memory consumption, though, because um, all the memory goes to the intermediate activations of the convolutions, and you know there's like at least 64 of those per voxel. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, we still have five minutes for, for discussion. So if, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Uh, in, in the meantime, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think is the lower bound of, of data? Like how small could you go? For example, if, if you just have, let's say, 100 images, could you do something? Yes, you can. Uh, we did not try that in our paper. And uh, if you simply took our implementation and tried it with like 10 images, it wouldn't work all that well. But there are papers that can that can do it. Uh, so, for example, th there's a paper that came after ours, kind of largely motivated by our paper, that simplifies the G and D architecture considerably. So there's much fewer parameters, much less to learn. And uh, the, the point basically was that if you do those kind of modi modifications, then you can easily train with extremely small amounts of data and the training becomes extremely fast. Of course, the downside is that then if you have crippled the models in this way, then they will not be able to learn like bigger data sets anymore. But there, there's a continuum. You can, you can do this kind of uh, modifications to get there. Then also, there's uh, the paper called SINGAN and its follow-ups where you train with a single image. It's an interesting case because, you know, it, it's not really training. It's only about fitting your model to reproduce that particular image. And that allows you to do interesting things like animate the image, like, like animate any kind of stochastic effects smoke, um, grass waving in the wind, that kind of things in the image, or maybe scale it, change the aspect ratio and stuff like that. Okay, thanks. And, and then Jörg has a sort of also comment in the chat that would some kind of curriculum learning in combination with data augmentation help go even lower in the data size? Um, there's an ongoing project um, with one of Jakob's students. He, he's been testing exactly that. Um, it's inconclusive as of yet, but maybe. Okay, thanks. Uh, then may maybe I have a final question. So I, I was wondering that to me your ADA approach seems like some kind of uh, confidence calibration. So could you actually apply this as a, for example, in just general classification to sort of compact overfitting adaptively instead of the classical one where you have a regularizer and then you just have a constant coefficient? I've been wondering about the same. You probably could, um, but then again, the competition in image classification is fierce and, you know, people spend massive amounts of compute in tuning those parameters. So, so in practice, if you want to get like better results in the absolute sense, that, that's going to be hard nevertheless. But, but yeah, I, I, I do think if you can somehow robustly enough detect overfitting, then you could tune the parameters according to that. I think uh, currently the state of the art there is that you do tune the augmentation parameters, but that's kind of a meta-learning problem. Y you just try a lot of different uh, parameter combinations and you know run them all in parallel. Okay, thanks. Okay, I, I think we can, we can conclude the session, so we, are, we still have one minute. Okay, I, I want to thank, uh, thank the speaker for, for the excellent talk and, and also the audience for your attention and, and good discussion. And we will come back next week, so next Monday we will have a talk by, by Rinu Boni. Okay, so have a nice day. Goodbye everyone.